Chapter 8. The Missing Years If ever there was a bit of quiet period in my life, and then not much, it was probably after I came out of jail that first time in 2005 and started trying to find my way. I had the comfort blanket of the football lads. In the tribal town like Luton, you needed something to belong to, and those blokes were my gang. These were the only places I felt safe, or at least where I felt safe, felt at home. And there was my fiancé. Despite what we'd been through then, like now, we were still the real thing. I didn't do romance much, if you hadn't noticed. She stuck with me through some serious ups and downs, that girl. Well, perhaps not so much ups as downs. When I got out of Bedford Nick, I had three months on a tag, and I was at a bit of a loose end. It wouldn't be the last time, it was probably the first time. I went back to my Irish developer, pal Dave, and I called Little Legs, I can get away with calling him that, being about the same size, and told him I was desperate for some work. The job at Minor Planet was disappearing, obviously, while the aeronautical engineering career was a long-gone dream. I needed to work, and Dave was good to me then, as he's always been. He gave me a labouring job here and there, on all kinds of projects up, up and down the place. Once I had to shift a thousand sheets of plasterboard from one end of Stevenage Town Centre to the other. That was hard graft. I did some window fitting for him in London, all kinds of jobs. I also started doing some buying and selling as well, on the side, getting stuff off one bloke who had some extras for the sale, shifting onto other people who were on the lookout for a bargain. A proper little Dale boy, too right, in more ways than one. If there was a real deal to be done, I was on the phone. It would end up causing me no grief, if only because tanning saloons are, by nature, the most costly cash business. And when I started the EDL and brought the police crashing down on me, that was the first place they looked. That shop was doing 2,000 a week, but only about £400 of it was on credit and debit cards. The authorities thought they had me bang to rights for all kinds of tax evasion or money laundering. And then I showed them my garage with six bin liners packed with till receipts of virtually every single penny that came through the business. Some poor bastard from the police had to spend two years going through these bin liners, squaring away every boring receipt. We had 60 clients a day, all their account details on their till receipts and there were thousands that this geezer had to scrutinise in time and in day order. They thought we were taking a grand and putting two through the till, but I knew it was all clean. It didn't stop them trying to find a different way to ruin my life, though. Meanwhile, apart from watching Luton Town, my other passion was following the England football team wherever they were playing. The highlight of the adventures, and there were a few, was when a group of us went to the World Cup in Germany for a month in 2006. It's a wonder I got home from that in one piece. Fantastic times, even if the memory of climbing on the window ledge of the hospital about six floors up, wearing just a hospital gown with my arse hanging out, is still enough to wake me up in a cold sweat. We didn't go looking for trouble, but it had a funny way of finding us. We were travelling around in a motorhome, a bunch of mad lads in their early twenties, a couple of great blokes in Kev, Mac, Morris, plus one geezer in his forties, Little Middleton. Poor Lee, he probably still hasn't gotten over that trip. He seemed to think he could be a calming influence on us, but it didn't quite work out that way. As far as the football side of things went, we kicked off with a 1-0 win against Paraguay in Frankfurt. Then it was on to Nuremberg for a 2-0 win against Trinidad and Tobago. And the first group stage match, 2-2 draw with Sweden in Cologne. There was a 1-0 win against Ecuador in Stratgert. And finally, the inevitable quarter-final defeat in the penalties against Portugal in Gelsenkirchen. It was a great time. The German people were very friendly and there was something about being in such a large group of England fans Men who didn't know you, but had your back, come what may. But then there was trouble too, with football hooligans. Being football hooligans the world over, there was usually a ruck awaiting not too far away. 
It probably didn't help that somebody in our group had a bunch of counterfeit euros that the German police side took an understandable interest in. They raided the motorhome and it ended up with me and one of the lads, Carly, being arrested, except that I had some kind of fit when I took a whack over the head from one of the police. I really don't remember much except waking up in hospital with a police guard at the door and realising this was very bad news indeed. Don't ask me what I was thinking. It was like a cross between the great escape and something at a carry-on nurse because the first chance I got of unplugging the IV tube on my arm, climbed out onto the window ledge about six floors up, edged along the clambered back in through the other window further down the corridor. I grabbed a bunch of towels, which I pretended to be carrying. I could see the copper outside my room and legged it. I flagged down a bloke in a car and he kindly, very kindly, took me back to the motorhome. Poor old Kylie was kept banged up for a fortnight. Lee, meanwhile, had enough of it all and moved out. He might have been close to a breakdown, but he certainly was when we dropped him at the hotel, parked outside, all got naked on the motorhome roof, and he tried to check in. He didn't deserve it, and he didn't deserve what happened next, because he flew home to get away from us. Then thought he'd sneak back on his own to watch the rest of the footy in peace, except they nicked him at the airport and gave the poor bloke a football banning order. I'll bet he wished he'd never set eyes on us. Great times. It wouldn't be my last football-related experience briefly in Germany, although there wasn't a ball or a player in sight on the next occasion. To flash forward in time, briefly, it was one of those craziest stunts we ever pulled while running the EDL. I suppose it shows just how mad things got and how close to being out of control we were, or should I say, I was. I knew the leader of the world football, Seb Blatter, is having his problems these days, but it isn't the first time. I might only be a short ass, but I made Blatter look up to me quite literally. This would be in November 2011, when England were playing a friendly against Spain, and the match was on the weekend on Remembrance Sunday. A lot of British teams wore poppy emblems on their shirts at this time of the year, and it seemed a good idea for England to do the same, except the Fifer came out and said they couldn't. Me and a few of the boys were sitting around raging about how unjust this was, and the next thing you know, we were on the plane to Zurich, where Set Blatter and Fifer have their headquarters. I'd rushed out and had this banner made, but it's all too manic that I actually got on the plane without it. My cousin and EDL sidekick Kev came over, all boys Scottish over that. He said, you have one bloody job and you balls it up. He wasn't wrong. But then again, I probably hadn't been in bed for the best part of two days. This was when things got altogether too wild. We booked in this plush hotel at Zurich, me and Kev, Nick Red, Dave Cooling and Tim Ablett. They gave us a plastic room card, and while the other lads went out on the piss, I got drinking with the other guests. A bunch of Americans were good company. I think I remember through the haze. The trouble was coming down for breakfast the next morning. They told me that the room card was maxed out, a thousand pounds. I'm not surprised all the guests were saying, Morning, Tommy, and waving. I got the entire hotel pissed on our room bill. When I told Kevin, he laughed his ass off, and then I reminded him that they were booking the rooms on his credit card. He nearly shit himself. In fact, I turned around, and he'd already grabbed his stuff and bolted. He found a Pakistani taxi driver to run us around and organise some of the new banners, which cost another £250. There was a slight problem picking it up, though. We were in Switzerland, and the banner was in Germany and I hadn't paid the fine. I got landed with on the World Cup jolly, so that was a worry. Anyway, long story short, we got the banner, and a little Pakistani taxi driver took us back to the Pfeiffer headquarters, and at that point, the other lads had second thoughts. So the driver took me and Kev up to the gate, and said he had delegates from the English FA. That got us into the grounds at least, but they wouldn't let us on the building so we walked around the back and hang out for a service door until someone opened it and then we were in. We worked all the way to the top of the building like that 
And the next thing you know, we was climbing on the roof and holding up our banner. Down on the street, this little Pakistani geezer was with the other lads, and he didn't believe his eyes. And there was the one, and there was the one and only Seb Blatter and all his executives standing outside, looking up at us and wondering what the hell was going on. They sent up security and the police, but we said we'd jump if they came in a closer and that we weren't coming down until they changed their minds over the poppies on England's shirts. We must have been there six hours, and my toes were like little blocks of ice. It was freezing, and we were really hadn't thought things through. It had the required effect, though. I was phoning back home, and we eventually got the word Fife had backed down. England could wear the black armbands with a poppy insignia. It was a great result, although Prince William and the Prime Minister appealing to Pfeiffer might have helped a bit. Certainly, anyone was eager to give them the credit and avoid saying anything positive about EDL. Not that that was a surprise, obviously. As for us, well, not so good. And certainly not for Kev. When we came down from the roof, they nicked us and put us in the Swiss jail for three days. I was in with a Liberian geezer who spoke a bit of English, a decent bloke. I don't know if the locals never break the law, but there didn't seem to be any Swiss people in the cell. The treatment was good, and one police officer told me they understood why they'd done it, to honour our soldiers, and that they respected our protest, given that they'd been on a bender for the past few days. I welcomed the peace and quiet, and chanced to catch up on some kip. When we got out, I was buzzing, hilarious wild, with a piece of PR for the EDL, it had been, or so I thought. You should have seen Kev's face. Funny, he said. You fucking what? I've been banged up with a cell full of violent Somalians for three days and sleeping with one eye open because they were looking at me like I was an unopened fucking Christmas present. I said, but it wasn't all bad, Kev. What about the English radio station? Radio station? What English radio station? That button on the wall, by the door. For the radio, mate. You mean you didn't push it to see what happened? I thought he was going to have a fit again. When we went to court, this gorgeous female officer was busting a gut trying to keep a straight face over it all. We got a fine, and we had just enough money left for a McDonald's when we got out. I rang my mate Keeley back home. He wasn't one of the EDL or football lads, just one of the great stand-up friends you seem to make as kids, who's there for you through thick and thin. Later, when I was inside, I got my one phone call, and it was the day before my wedding anniversary. I didn't, I didn't call my solicitor, I called Keeley, and he sorted flowers for my wife. On that occasion, in Zurich, he stumped up the cash for our flights and to get us home, no questions asked. What a crack it had been all. Even if Kev wasn't quite as made up about it all, that crazy adventure had all started with us simply wanting to honour our military heroes in the streets of Luton, and we'd ended up on the roof of the Pfeiffer World Headquarters. I suppose people will want to know exactly how the journey began.